Hi, I'm Tori. I am a doctor of physical therapy and I specialize in pelvic dysfunction. And I wanted to make this video because I see women almost every day who have in some part of their journey through the healthcare system been given dilators. But even though dilators can be incredibly therapeutic and such a helpful tool, a lot of times the women that I see were given dilators but given no instruction as to how to use the dilators or why they were given the dilators to use in the first place. And so I wanted to make a video addressing both why to use dilators and how to use dilators. All of that being said, if you were given dilators in the healthcare system, whether by your primary care physician or maybe your gynecologist, chances are very, very high that you would benefit from pelvic physical therapy. So if you check in the description below, I'm going to link a directory so that you can find a pelvic physical therapist near you so that you can get the therapy that you need. So if you were given dilators, you likely reported something along the lines of my underwear or wearing tight clothing bothers my vagina, I have a really hard time tolerating tampons, or I have to use the child speculum, the pediatric speculum with gynecologist's appointments, which is that instrument that gynecologists use to insert and then open the vaginal canal so that they can see everything. Or maybe you reported that you're having painful sex, or maybe you said that you are avoiding sex entirely because you can't tolerate any form of penetration. Essentially, you said something along the lines of touch and or penetration hurts my vagina and someone gave you dilators. So before we dive into how to use dilators, I think it's really important that you understand why you would be using dilators. There are two lenses to look through here. One lens is musculoskeletal in nature and it's very straightforward and the other lens is more your brain and your brain's relationship to pain and that one takes a little bit more explanation. So the more straightforward one, the musculoskeletal lens is simple. In the same way that stretching a really tight hamstring can be therapeutic, stretching the pelvic floor muscles that live around the vaginal opening can also be very therapeutic. And dilators are a slow progressive stretch to those muscles. I would argue, however, that the brain-related lens is just as, if not more important than the musculoskeletal lens. So when I'm working with someone and we're using dilators, our intention is not only to stretch the muscles, but also to retrain this person's brain around the idea of touch or penetration. If we were working together, one of the first things that I would have you do is read this book. It's called Why Pelvic Pain Hurts, and it is a phenomenal book written in language meant for every human, not just medical providers. And what it does is it explains the most up-to-date pain science we have, which all has to do with your brain and how your brain interprets threat and danger. It's like 60 pages, it's super duper easy to read, and you can get it on Amazon for under 20 bucks. I think it's $19 and some change. I'll add a link in the description below to this book on Amazon if you're interested in reading it. So why focus on your brain and retraining your brain and what does that have to do with pelvic pain? everything. Pain is not only a normal experience, but it's also vital to being human. It's what we use to survive. But here's the crazy thing about pain. Pain is produced entirely 100% by your brain. It functions kind of like an alarm system. If something is threatening or dangerous, your brain will send an alarm to you and let you know that you should pay attention to it. In order to use dilators to their fullest therapeutic ability, you need to understand one, that hurt doesn't always equal harm, and that two, your alarm system, your brain can become too sensitive, which could cause it to send pain signals when there isn't actually injury. So I wanna use an example, a palpable example, as to how this relationship works. So this example is gonna be an example of harm not necessarily equaling hurt. So let's imagine that you're going for a walk. Maybe there are some abandoned train tracks by your house and you're outside, you're on a walk, and you stub your toe. That's gonna hurt, no question. Your brain is gonna wanna alert you that you stubbed your toe and that maybe you require some sort of 
medical attention to get the kind of treatment that you need. But let's change up the scenario a little bit and imagine that you're on these train tracks, you stub your toe, and there's a train coming full speed ahead. Do you think your toe is gonna hurt? No. Your brain is gonna prioritize your survival. It's gonna prioritize you being able to run out of the way so that you live before it tells you about your toe that you stubbed. So maybe once you are totally safe and you've run away and you're gonna survive, you'll get some sort of pain response to that stubbed toe, but certainly not while you're running away. An even more palpable example would be, have you ever been getting ready for bed, ending your day, and you look on your leg or your arm and there's a bruise, but you have no recollection of how you got that bruise? That would be your brain deciding that this tissue injury did not warrant your attention, so it didn't send a pain signal to you. It didn't alarm you. Your alarm system didn't go off. So two very palpable examples as to how harm doesn't always equal hurt. Tissue injury, like a stubbed toe or a bruise, doesn't always mean that you are going to experience pain. So we know now with those examples that tissue injury doesn't always equal pain, that harm doesn't always equal hurt, but is it true that pain doesn't always equal injury or that hurt doesn't always equal harm? The answer to that question is Yes. I want to credit Why Pelvic Pain Hurts and its authors for this next analogy because it is brilliant and I use it in my clinic all the time. So remember when we were talking about your brain as an alarm system. Imagine the alarm system that you have in your house. You want that alarm system to go off when you have some sort of big issue like somebody's breaking into your house or somebody broke a window. But imagine if that alarm system went off every time somebody walked by your house or every time a leaf blew in front of the door. That is an example of an alarm system that's become very, very sensitive. Your brain can do the exact same thing. Your brain can become very, very sensitive and then it takes very little stimulus like maybe tight clothing, underwear, inserting a tampon, sex, to send off an alarm like pain even though there is no tissue injury. So hurt doesn't always equal harm and it's really important that you understand that if you're gonna be using dilators because one of our intentions is gonna to be to retrain your brain to know that touch and penetration to the vaginal opening is not threatening or dangerous so that you don't send off pain alarms. Now I wanna pause and say a really important piece. A lot of times when I'm working with someone that has been given dilators or that I have chosen to use dilators with given their presentation, this person will have been through a lot of medical providers who have invalidated their pain. And so I wanna take this time to say that this is not at all me saying that your pain is in your head. It's not. Your pain experience is very real and very valid. Instead, this is me saying that we can use dilators to retrain your muscles and your brain so that you can have pain-free sex or a pain-free pelvic exam or use tampons without pain or wear that pair of awesome jeans that you love. I also want to take this time to say that you are not alone in this experience. I want you to know that I talk about dilators and pain science every day in my clinical practice. So let's shift gears now that we have an understanding of why we would use dilators and talk about how to use them. So I will outline what I usually do with someone who I've decided to use dilators with, but I do wanna pause and say again, if you were given dilators, you would probably benefit from pelvic physical therapy. Please check out the link in the description so that you can find a pelvic therapist near you. I also wanna pause and say that this can't substitute as medical advice, treatment, intervention, etc. Know that this is general information, not me giving any sort of medical treatment over a video because that's, I can't. Also, if you're someone who would rather read about this or at least have some words in front of you, I did write an article about dilator use and there is a link to that article on my website in the description below. One of the things that I want to talk about before we talk about setup and actual use of the dilators is 
language. When I am working with someone, a lot of times I find that women will take on the role of being penetrated. And I think that when you take on the role of being penetrated by a dilator, you give a lot of power to an inanimate object. And I want you to have the power, not the dilator. So instead of being penetrated by the dilator, I want you to imagine that you are enveloping the dilator. I know that that might sound like a very small tweak, but it can be very powerful. I don't want you to feel like something is being done to you. I want you to feel like you are doing something. So how do we use dilators? The first thing I'm gonna cue you to do is create a very calming environment for both you and your brain. So this can mean a number of things. Maybe that means taking a really nice hot shower or a bath to help you de-stress. Maybe that means listening to some really soothing music. Maybe that means lighting a candle or some sort of incense or maybe some lavender. Or maybe that means practicing some deep breathing. Whatever you know is helpful for you for relaxation, I want you to do something relaxing before you use the dilators to set the right mood and environment. So then what position are you supposed to get in? I will insert photos of me in at least two different positions that work well for dilator use. Essentially what you want to do is make sure that you are in a position that is very, very comfortable where you have good support so that you're not crunching your abdomen and holding your breath when you're trying to insert the dilators. You want your abs to be nice and relaxed because your stomach muscles and your pelvic floor muscles work in tandem. And if one of them isn't relaxed, it's gonna be really hard for the other one too. So positioning is really important. Don't be scared to make yourself a throne of pillows. Once you get into a really comfortable position, I want you to use some imagery. I want you to imagine using your dilators and try to direct that imagery positively. So if just the thought of using the dilators gives you fear or stress or anxiety, I want you to imagine using the dilators and there being no stress, no pain, no fear and no anxiety. Please use lubricant. You can use a liberal amount of lubricant both on the dilator and on your vaginal opening. But if your dilators are made of silicone, please don't use silicone-based lubricant because you'll end up degrading the dilators over time and that can make them less safe for you to use. So let's take out some dilators. Some dilators will have something called a stopper and others won't. The ones that we use at my clinic do have a stopper, so let me pull those out now. So when I talk about a stopper, I mean this thing. What you do with this is attach the dilator that you are starting with to it. Ours are pretty simple. There is a little click and turn here and then you've got something to hold on to while you are using your dilators at home. So the next thing that you wanna do is insert the dilator. Now, my rule of thumb with dilator use is that I don't want my person that's using these dilators to be at more than a three out of 10 discomfort where zero is nothing and 10 is the worst. And the reason that I stress discomfort and not pain is because Stretching a different muscle, like imagine stretching your hamstring, that can be uncomfortable, it can feel like a stretch. I'm okay with that kind of feeling, but I don't want you to be in pain because we're trying to retrain your brain that this isn't threatening or dangerous. And so the more neutral experiences that we can have with the dilators, the better we are with retraining your brain. So if this is my hand vagina and this is my dilator, I want you to slowly insert the dilator, making sure that you are at no greater than a three out of 10 discomfort and pay attention to how you feel. Please remember that you can pause. Let's say you get to maybe halfway. You can pause and hold the dilator still at any position at any time and advance it when you feel ready. And if you aren't ready to advance all the way, that's okay. You can hold the dilator halfway or 75% or 25% or anything in between. Once you've got the dilator inserted to the position that you're planning on keeping it, I always recommend using some sort of pillow or blanket to place up against 
the stopper. Imagine using a pillow or a blanket here so that you can truly relax around the dilator and so that when you are relaxing, the dilator doesn't slide back out. If you are having trouble relaxing around your dilator, one of the things that you can do is check in with your breathing. I will make more content about breath and its relationship to the pelvic floor, but for now, trust me when I say you can directly influence your pelvic floor with your breath. And I think that it might be a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually on the inhale that your pelvic floor is going to elongate and relax. So if you are having trouble relaxing, try some nice deep belly breaths where you are pushing your air down and out into your stomach, a nice belly big, belly hard inhale, and an effortless exhale, and see if that helps. Once you have your dilator, inserted to the appropriate spot for you with your stopper supported by a pillow or a blanket you're comfortable and you're relaxing try to stay in that position for about five minutes repeat this every day and add one minute to that time until you reach 10 minutes so day one do five day two do six and then seven and then on up until you reach the 10 minute mark now I will pause and say here that I work with some women where doing this every day is very appropriate and then I work with other women where doing it every day would be too much and they would be too sore. So I don't recommend every day for everyone. I recommend that you see a provider and work with that person and figure out the right frequency for you. Maybe it's not every day, maybe it's every other day, maybe it's every two days and there's nothing wrong with that. My rule of thumb is once you can insert have the dilator inserted for 10 minutes and remove without pain, I think you're ready to bump up to the next level. I would have somebody repeat this series and move up in the dilator levels until we reach the dilator that most closely resembles that person's goal. The dilators that we use come in six different levels. So the one that I've been using in the video is a level one and it would move up to a level two and then a level three, and then a level four, a level five, and finally, a level six. Now, if I'm working with someone and their goal is to be able to use a junior tampon, our dilator use is gonna be a lot different than if I'm working with someone and their goal is to return to pain-free, dare I say pleasurable, sex with their partner. Let me also pause and say, if your goal was to return to sex with your partner and your partner was bigger than a level six dilator, know that your pelvic physical therapist would continue to work with you if you got to a level six dilator and intercourse was still painful. We are not scared to get creative. It's also really important to pause and say that everyone's goal with dilator use is different and that it might take one person more time than it takes another person to reach those goals and that's okay. What's important is that you know that you're in control and that you can make a difference in your well-being. I want you to take this newfound knowledge and empowerment, make sure that you stay patient and kind with yourself, and move forward at a rate that makes the most sense for you and your unique set of circumstances. In closing, dilators can be an incredibly helpful and therapeutic tool, but they can also be really scary when nobody talks to you about why or how to use them. I hope that they're a little bit less scary now and make more sense. Please, please, please don't forget if you were given dilators and you're not currently seeing a pelvic physical therapist, chances are high that you would benefit from seeing one. So check out that link in the description to see if you can find one in your area so that you can get the therapy that you need. I hope that this video was helpful. I hope that you feel empowered to move forward and take your well-being into your own hands. And please don't hesitate to comment in the comment section below with any questions you have or other videos around pelvic dysfunction that you'd like to see. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for watching. And don't forget, if you'd rather read, there is a link to the article that I wrote in the description. Okay, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.